Okay, recording is started as of right now. Do not say anything that is off the record. This recording will be distributed to all my paying subscribers as an unlisted YouTube video tomorrow. And anybody can actually, even though it's unlisted, anybody can share that link. So assume that anybody can hear what we're talking about um, in this uh, session. Okay, hello, everybody. I am, as you know, uh, Simon Owens. Uh, and this is my regular office hours series. And as people who have been attending these for a while know, uh, the the theme the theme that I always try to push in these office hours is participation. I don't want to be this to be one of those boring webinars where it's just me and the guests talking back and forth, and there's like maybe a ten minute Q and A at the end where you finally get to answer questions. Like I want people speaking up early and often. Uh, I want to speak as little as possible. Like of course. When I will fill any kind of dead air with more and more questions, but I love to just shut up and let other people ask questions or, you know, there are a lot of other really successful media operators on this call to also uh, lend their expertise. So definitely do not hesitate to chime in on the chat so I can call you or in some cases, just unmute your mic and just try to butt into the conversation, uh, you know, as long as you're do able to do it kind of, you know, uh, tactfully. Um, so yeah, definitely. Definitely participate. Um, you probably noticed when you came in, you are all on mute to start out with. When you're not talking, please try to stay on mute as much as you know as much as possible, um, so that there's not like background noise or anything like that. Um, uh, background noise because when the with when people see the recording, the camera is going to focus on whoever is making noise. So we don't want to create a lot of distractions that way. So try to stay on mute as much as possible. Um, and with all that being said, uh, let's get into itself. So uh, today's featured guest and kind of our topic is uh, Dan Ochinsky. Uh, Dan, you know, is really well known in the newsletter space. Uh, he famously was the first director of newsletters at BuzzFeed uh, back in the early 2010s when kind of the whole newsletter trend was just getting fired up and publishers were starting to recognize that it's better to own your audience rather than outsource your audience to uh, big social media platforms. So he basically grew that entire network of newsletters from scratch. And then he was poached away by The New Yorker, my favorite magazine. I've been the subscriber for going on 15 years. And uh, he, his kind of introduction was coinciding right when The New Yorker was ramping up its digital paid subscriptions. Um, so he really built out their newsletter apparatus. And as, as I'm sure he'll talk about today, newsletters are one of the leading drivers of all kinds of great uh, KPIs that that publishers are looking for, from you know increased engagement to, uh, to uh, repeat web visits to conversions into paid subscriptions, and then a few years ago he let, he basically struck off on his own and he launched Inbox Collective, which is basically a um, uh, a newsletter consultancy, and he works with. Publishers, but probably, and maybe he can enlighten us on who's some of the others. But I think he works with all kinds of brands that are looking to really kind of bring their uh, email marketing and newsletter games to the next level. So, uh, welcome, Dan. Really glad to have you on. Thanks for having me. So we're gonna jump right. I'm gonna jump right into asking you questions. But again, I love people to chime in and interrupt me and uh, basically kind of take over uh, the discussion. Um, so feel free to start uh, pinging pinging us with questions and stuff like that. So Dan, to start with, a lot of the publishers you work with uh, probably they probably have legacy newsletters that they've been running for years, like that were basically like link roundups to their articles. They were probably automated uh, that were going out every morning and every week that ba basically, you know, just driving traffic to the, to the news sites. And I think a lot of these publishers are probably hiring you and saying, we recognize we need to take our newsletters to the next level. We need to be doing more there than just this automated link route up. So like when you're, when you're, when you're doing a typical engagement with a publisher and you're, you're first coming in, can you talk about some of the low hanging fruit 
that you're often looking for when you're first getting into there, you know, asking them questions? And what are some of the like the early things that you see a lot of publishers not doing that you're recommending to them to kind of, you know, bring their newsletters to the next level and and drive, you know, greater results, whether it's more traffic, more engagement or paid subscribers? So the publishers that I'm working with, and this isn't just limited to them, but publishers in general, I've really started to invest in email and I'd say the last five to six years. But there's still a number of stragglers in this space who are just starting to recognize that there's an opportunity here. And so for most publishers that I talk to, even well-established ones who made investments, the low-hanging fruit is, uh, <laughs> there's quite a lot of it to, to look at. It comes in terms of the products that you're launching and testing you're doing around those products. It comes in the form of surveys and audience research. It comes in the form of growth strategy and monetization. That could be ads. It could be reader revenue. Um, and also thinking about the workflow and processes. To be you know, pretty blunt, most news organizations and most publishers are still in the very early stages of building out a successful newsletter strategy. Most have a lot of room for investment and growth. That's a really good thing as far as I'm concerned because these publishers do see when they start to invest whether it's hiring someone to lead their newsletter strategy, starting to invest a little bit more on the growth side of things, thinking about how they better convert readers into paying subscribers, they start to see pretty good returns fairly early on because many of them haven't been doing a lot in this space. So just doing something as opposed to nothing usually returns a pretty good investment early on. Now, of course, you have to continue to invest and grow and build the strategies and workflows and teams to support it. But most publishers are still in the very early stages of, of building out a successful newsletter strategy. So let's talk about, let's drill down into what you're, some of the stuff you're talking about. Like one of the things you mentioned was surveys. And I think like a lot of these publishers who are engaging with you, they probably know very little about their legacy email newsletter list. They haven't cleaned those lists in a while. I think like one of the under leveraged things for publishers is surveys, not just surveys that exist on like a survey monkey or something, but now there are a lot of tools coming online to where you can actually embed polls directly into your, your newsletter and it, they only have to click once and you can collect like demographic data. <clears throat> How are you, you know, coming on to a new publisher that has like a huge legacy list? How are you advising them to use surveys uh, more effectively and, and what ways can they use them to, to improve their newsletter strategy? So when I talk with a publisher who <laughs> is thinking about launching a new product, for instance, or thinking about launching a new newsletter, how do we decide what's the right thing to launch? I talk a lot about how we triangulate some of the information to figure out what might, what might make sense. So we might be using editorial intuition, knowledge to say, hey, we know what we're good at writing a certain type of content. We're using existing data. This could be Google Analytics. This could be data from your email service provider. What do people click on? What do they share? What do they spend time on? And then survey data is kind of the third piece. What is the audience telling you when they actually take the time to to provide feedback. And it could be through stuff, uh, like Simon mentioned, some of these survey sorts of tools, um, you know, more indie sorts of public or indie sorts of ESPs like uh, Substack is one, Beehive is one, have built-in polling tools. There's things like Feedletter, which is a really great one, pretty inexpensive that anyone could use and embeds with just about any ESP, costs like a hundred bucks a year. Um, that works really well for in-newsletter polling. You could also think about, you know, of course, stuff like SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, Typeform uh, that are out there and are really useful for collecting information. Some ESPs, MailChimp is one, has their own you know, built-in survey tool as well, which integrates really nicely. So you can collect yeah. a lot of information. But for publishers, the big things I'm telling them to ask around, one is anytime I run a survey, always asking them to, to ask something numeric. Scale of one to five, one to 10. I actually like to do a lot of my surveys on a scale of one to four. And it's because they can't pick a middle option. They can't tell me, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I'm, I'm a five. What does a five yeah. tell me? I want to tell them more positive or negative. How do you feel? I'm always asking for something around the, the job of the newsletter, what it does for readers. Tell me what the value is. Why do you open this on a regular basis? What are you looking for? And I'm always looking for something open-ended sometimes multiple open-ended questions. How could I do better? Will you give me a testimonial? Tell me what I can do more of to serve readers like you. And then I'm probably layering on some additional questions depending on what I'm really looking for. Uh, like if I'm doing a survey tied to 
a rollout of a, a new paid or reader revenue strategy, I'm asking questions around benefits, around features, around price points to get a sense of what the audience might tell me. Knowing, of course, that with any of these surveys, you're getting a percentage of the audience to provide feedback, but not the whole audience. So you have to combine it with some other data sources to really get the big picture of you know, what's happening, what does the audience want? But a lot of publishers, when I talk to them and I say, you know, have you done surveys? The response is usually, we know we should, but, and actually we know we should, but applies to just about everything that I talk with teams about. Have you done a welcome series for your newsletters? Oh, we know we should, but, you know, have you really been investing in A-B testing? We know we should, but, and so I think for so many in this space, whether you're a traditional publisher or whether you're an indie kind of operator, the good news is you're probably not as far behind as you think because so many in this space are still getting their strategy up to speed, are still rolling things out. In fact, a lot of the indie kind of operators that I talk to are ahead of what larger publishers are doing because they've had the time and had, you know, really been forced to invest in some of these strategies. They had to build out a welcome series because, well, they had to build a relationship as soon as possible. They didn't have years and years of relationships with the community to, you know, fall back on. They had to think about building a revenue strategy from day one because they needed to make money from day one. Uh, they had to think about surveys because they needed to collect more information. So in general, what I'd say is there's so many spaces to invest. Surveys is definitely one. I am you know, increasingly convinced that publishers and indie operators who don't have a survey strategy really don't have a newsletter strategy on the whole. You're kind of guessing if you're not getting some sort of data, it could be polls, it could be larger surveys, but you got to be collecting information somehow from your audience to say, I know what they want because they're telling me and I'm spending the time to actually listen to what they have to say. Yeah, the, one of my favorite ways to use surveys in my newsletter is um, is to get demographic data that I can then put on my advertising page. Like sure. I have a break, detailed breakdown of what industries my readers um, work it like what they work in. So then I can put that up, you know, a breakdown that of of those percentages on my advertising page. So an advertiser really knows who my audience is. I've also found in, you know, with polls that, um, that it's a great way just to add some extra engagement to your newsletter. Like I write sure. like an op, you know, I wrote this week about creator monetization with creator funds. And then I embedded a poll at the very end is which platform do you think is doing creator monetization the best? And then not only is it give them something to click on to participate, but then they're landing on the web version of the article that I wrote, like the web mm -hmm. version of the newsletter, which makes them, it may much easier for them to take that URL and plug it into Twitter or Facebook and, sure. and share it and stuff like that. Like, do you think like, polls and stuff like are also just a great way to just get your users more engaged and forming habits and stuff like that? Oh, absolutely. And especially in a world where with some of the changes that Apple's made in the last few years with the rollout of male privacy protection, it being a little bit tougher to know who's really engaged or not because Apple is inflating some open rates, that additional sort of simple poll at the end, hey, vote, tell me what you think, whether it's, did you like this content? Yes or no. Whether it's, tell me something that you're interested in. Whether it's using polling you know, technology to do things like uh, a piece of trivia. Anything small that gets people to click to and say like, hey, I'm here, I'm actually engaged, is absolutely a good thing. And so, yeah, you mentioned Apple's updates to uh, iOS that make it kind of obscure the true open rates and stuff like that. Um, a lot of these publishers that are hiring you are probably have 20 year old email lists. Uh, some of, you know, some of which, you know, obviously a lot of people unsubscribe when they stop reading, but a lot of people just leave it on autopilot and just stop reading. List cleaning is getting a lot harder now with all these things. Like there are, there's not only the iOS thing, there are programs now that I've noticed where they'll automatically go and click on every link in a, in a um, newsletter to make sure there's no malware or anything like that, stuff like that. Sure. You know, when you're advising on um, advising on list cleaning, especially when you're just starting up with a client, what are the things you're thinking through now versus what you were thinking through like five or six years ago? So there are some challenges that are here now because of MPP that weren't there a couple of years ago for what it's worth on the note of, you know, technology that clicks every link. That's most common among 
people with a .gov or .edu email addresses, those types of organizations tend to have pretty strict uh, IT policies. They want to make sure they're not accidentally downloading any malware to their, their you know, servers or systems. But for most users, there are, you really still can not tell who's engaging or not. And you could do it a couple of ways. One is, if you're looking at your audience data and saying, hey, who are the people who haven't opened a newsletter in, say, the last 90 days? If someone is showing up as having 0% you know, open rate, you can feel pretty confident they're really not opening your newsletter. They're not opening the newsletter. They didn't click on anything. And Apple didn't try to open a newsletter on their behalf. Uh, and then for the folks who might be showing a high open rate with no clicks, you could always look and say, Hey, let me show pull a segment of people who have opened a really high percentage of the uh, you know the emails over the last couple of months, but aren't clicking on anything. Maybe we want to target them with things in a newsletter, like a survey, uh, like a "Hey, are you still there? Click this link to make sure that you're still around." Kind of message, kind of simple to do. Before we might move someone into a reactivation campaign. I also have a, a <laughs> just finished up about a week ago, like a six thousand word story coming on reactivation in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but in big picture, reactivation, there's still plenty of opportunities out there. I would encourage anyone who hasn't done one of these to do one. Don't just clean your list. Send a couple different types of emails to try to win people back. Uh, you might want to do something simple like share it in case you missed it kind of email. Hey, here's a few stories that we published recently that are great. Check them out. Uh, if someone opens and clicks, fantastic. That person's still around. We might want to ask someone to update their preferences or change the newsletters they get from us. We might want to send what I call like the last chance email. Hey, do you still want emails from us? Click this button and we'll keep you on the list. Otherwise, we'll remove you. If you're doing emails like these two, I would recommend that you send from a different email address than usual. The reason is the first time an inbox sees a new email address, they're not sure what to do with it. And as long as all the authentication stuff is taken care of behind the scenes, they'll usually give you the benefit of the doubt. So sending from a different email address, you often end up in the main part of the inbox. A reader might go, oh, you know what? Your emails have been going to a weird folder. They've been going to spam. I did want to see them, though. Let me go find them and dig them out of that folder and drag them to the right place. Um, Margie and Peter, I definitely will get to your uh, your questions real quick. But Charlie, you do a form of list cleaning that has like a reactivation or a last chance email, right? I do, yeah. Um, it, it, when I, I go through and, uh, as, uh, as you've been discussing, look to see who has an open email in the last three months. Um, I've, I've set up a segment in uh, MailChimp that does that for me. And I have a letter I've crafted that says, Hey, you know, nobody wants to get email that they don't want. So if you still want it, click here. Um, and, uh, Typically, and you make it and you make it easy. You say, click on any link in this email and I'll yep. make sure that you stay on my list or something like that. You're a student of my work, Simon. I'm very <laughs> impressed. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, of course, when they click, then they they leave memberful's list of people who haven't clicked. So, yeah. And uh, for context, everybody, Charlie used to run newsletters for the Chicago Tribune and now runs uh, his own uh, local newsletter. Margie, you said that you've had some kind of anxiety around you know, Apple's updates and how do you clean your list without re removing, um, you know, uh, active readers? Does anything that Dan's saying kind of resonate to you or do you have any follow-up questions? So we're using HubSpot and we've done two reactivation series. Um, and my issue is that there's a place where we take event registrations where I've had people register for an event and the I know that they found out about it through our email, but HubSpot says they didn't open the email. So I'm now going real deep in HubSpot to try to figure out some way to not remove the people who might be Apple users. That was my first step. And I can't get that as a thing I can filter on unless I go through manually. So I like this idea of a survey. I'm just thinking of like, what are the thing could I get them to click on that I can filter based on? Yeah. And Dan, would you say to try to be as conservative and cautious as possible now that there are so many pitfalls into in terms of accidentally removing unactive people? Yeah. In general, if you can, again, try to figure out another data source that might say, oh, this person attended an event, they did something, they registered. That's something that you might be able to feed back into your into HubSpot using something like Zapier to say, hey, this person attended an event, tag them in our system as you know, attended attendee, 
uh, event attendee. Uh, and let's go ahead and keep them on the list. So when we're pulling the list of readers who are unengaged, we're looking at all the people who haven't opened and haven't clicked and who didn't do something like they didn't pay for a subscription or they didn't attend an event or something else out there. You can add in your own criteria to try to find the people who have done something with this, you know, something with, with you this year. In general, being fairly conservative with those folks, especially if they're showing a high open rate, you do want to be a little more cautious. You know, it's tough to know exactly what's happening behind the scenes. You're never going to be perfect. But if you have a pretty big segment of your audience that's showing as, you know, they're showing as engaged, they're showing as opening emails, but they haven't done something, give them the benefit of the doubt for a little bit longer than you would for someone who um, is showing a 0% open rate. Yeah. So Substack has some good metrics where you can track open rate clicks, but then also there's this like star system. So even if people land on your post, but they they haven't clicked through an email, but they land on the web version, they're logged in, it kind of recognizes that. And I'm extremely conservative when, when cleaning my list of like someone who hasn't opened, clicked on an email or landed as a logged in user on the page in over six months. And that's kind of like a good indication that maybe they really are actually not active anymore. Um, so I try to be very conservative about that. Peter, you had an, a question about LinkedIn newsletters, and this is something I'm getting approached about is are LinkedIn newsletters worth investing in? Obviously, LinkedIn has a huge social network. There's a social graph, so you get some benefits of audience growth there. And some people have reported, you know, growing. And also, they're emphasizing their newsletter tools right now. So people have seen a lot of growth there. But my sense is, is that LinkedIn doesn't allow you to export your list or anything like that. So is it a true newsletter? Peter, You want, what are your questions for, for us about LinkedIn newsletters? Well, I'm um, I'm really getting my newsletter started, so I don't have a particularly large list um, on ConvertKit, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to get interest um, in the newsletter. And uh, what I've been hearing others say, like Joe Polizzi and some others, is if you start your newsletter over on LinkedIn, or you do an, you do the newsletter on LinkedIn you may be able and you do a truncated version of what you're doing for the newsletter you're putting out by email you may be able to push people over from linkedin to sign up for your mailing list um, and you're going to get a much larger number of people who are seeing it at least from the outset now i have you know 2500 followers and 2600 fo and 2600 connections on linkedin so I'm trying to figure out a way to drive them over to the newsletter. And I'm just I'm just getting ready to launch next week and I'm I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that. And I know most of the people on here are far are, are much further along than I am. So um maybe this is a um you know, kind of a dumb question. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh so like I was actually did a consulting call with someone who was thinking about acquiring a LinkedIn newsletter. And so I you know, I warned them about how you know capricious the algorithm can be and how they don't own that audience and that was some of the advice i gave what you spoke to is having like a truncated version of the linkedin newsletter that you know creates some value but have some kind of call to action at the bottom to where if you want the full newsletter that has these extra features then click through here and sign up for the mailchimp version or whatever dan do you have more and more of uh cons your clients asking about linkedin newsletters and what are your kind of thoughts on it yeah, and I've had a number of calls over the years with the LinkedIn team about the newsletter feature. It's one of their accidental success stories. They built it, kind of forgot about it, then it worked for a bunch of people, and now they're trying to reinvest in the tool. But uh, it's really only because some folks had success with it, and they went, oh, goodness, this thing is working, and we're not investing in it. Maybe we should put some more resources into it. So we'll see how they invest over the coming months and years, uh, like you mentioned. You can't export a list. There's no way to monetize the newsletter unless you're selling ads directly and placing them manually within the product. Uh, so there's no revenue. There's, uh, aside from being able to link back to your own newsletter, kind of using it as a lead magnet, there isn't really a logical way to convert people from LinkedIn over. The people who are having the most success on LinkedIn are people who already have, or in terms of LinkedIn newsletters, are ones who already have a large LinkedIn presence. So when I've had conversations, for instance, with 
executives or influencers who already have in the tens or hundreds of thousands of LinkedIn followers, they have a lot of success with LinkedIn newsletters out of the gate. LinkedIn does a good job of broadcasting it, getting it in front of folks, getting people to sign up. But from there, converting people over to your own newsletter is a little bit of a challenge. You can certainly do it. You just want to be careful about how much you're investing in it. Maybe it's something you do for a couple months and see how it does. You know, with LinkedIn, something that's nice is when you send out a newsletter, one is they put it in somebody's feed. So if you follow them or you follow the newsletter, it shows up in your feed. Then you get a notification about it. Then if you don't engage with that and you have the app, you get a notification on the app that someone that you follow has posted a newsletter. And then if you don't engage with that, they send the email to you or they send the content to you as a newsletter. They really go above and beyond to get the content in front of you. Uh, the flip side is, again, converting people over to your own list, your own and operating list where you're actually seeing success and driving growth. I think for smaller uh, people have smaller presences, and and in this case, you know, I think for this one, Peter, like with your audience size on LinkedIn, I'm not sure it's where I would go. I would just focus on putting content out on the LinkedIn and trying to get people to come over to your newsletter using things like LinkedIn has their own little uh, link in bio kind of thing that you can do on your page. That sort of thing is worth tracking. Maybe you want to add a UTM or something like that to see how many conversions you're getting. But I would say for where you are right now, just trying to grow your own list as opposed to trying to build in two different places. I don't think there's any issue with posting on LinkedIn and trying to build an audience there. You should absolutely do that. I'm not sure that I would launch a newsletter there, though, at this stage of the game for you. I appreciate it, Dan. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so Dan, one of the things you talked about earlier was a welcome series. This is something that I'm not very educated on on best practices. Um, and certainly most publishers and creators don't have some, they're not really thinking through what these automated emails to start out with. Can you talk about like, you know, working with a new client, a new publisher and how to design a welcome series so that it's most effective and what, and what is it meant to accomplish really? Great question. So welcome series matter for a few reasons. One is that they typically get much higher open rates than your normal newsletter for a pretty simple reason. People have just signed up, they're opening, they're engaging because it's really early on in the relationship. And whether you're a big publisher or you're, you know, a, a, an operator like me or a lot of the folks on this call, especially if you're an operator who's kind of independent or a small team, they might not know a lot about you when you're getting started. Like I see Lexi Grants in the call. Lexi has the lovely, they got acquired newsletter. Somebody might share an article. You know, I've shared some of Lexi's articles with you know, clients and friends. They go, this is cool. What is this? So if you sign up for the newsletter, well, I want a welcome series there to introduce who am I? What am I doing? What is this kind of work? Uh, who are the people who are making this newsletter? What kind of stuff can you share with me that I might want to dive in and read? So often when I'm thinking about a welcome series, I'm thinking about a few steps. One is kind of an initial, what I call it, the hallmark email, the initial greeting email. Hey, you know, you just signed up for my newsletter. Here's who I am. Here's what you can expect from me when it's going to show up in your inbox. Is this newsletter showing up daily, weekly, at what times, on what days? What kind of stuff is going to show up in my inbox? Maybe a couple of days later, a note from, you know, the founder or writer or somebody important. Hey, let me tell you a little about who I am and why I work. I do the work that I do. And then from there, you have some choices. Maybe you want to nudge them to take a next step, uh, follow you on social media. Maybe you want to nudge them towards, uh, you know, Simon, if you're someone like you as a podcast, hey, I want to nudge you towards this sort of product. Uh, there's different ways you can engage with me. Maybe you want to highlight some of your best performing content. If you're new around here, start here. Here's a couple of my favorite articles, our best articles, our most popular things. So you can start to read and engage and get a sense of, you know, here's the good stuff. No matter when you're signing up, I know that in that first you know, 14 days, you're going to see some of the best performing things. And of course, if you have some sort of subscription strategy, a membership strategy, if you're selling products like courses, uh, or if you're teaching them something, you know, you have on-demand classes, you're doing consulting, maybe you want to nudge them towards that. Hey, if you're new around here, you've gotten to know me, you've read some of my best stuff, uh, I've nudged you towards following me on social, but now I also want to tell you about how I can help you. I have the subscription offer, here's what's in it. Here's the benefits. You should check it out. You know, when I used to, uh, I actually got, I used to do this for a long time with my own newsletter and had to stop just as the newsletter grew. But for the first three years of Inbox Collective, everyone in the first 30 days, the end of the 30 day period, got an offer to spend 30 with, minutes with me, no charge on a call. 
And it was hugely useful. One, it converted a lot of people to ultimately customers of mine. They got the chance to, you know, talk to me and know me. And I got to share some advice. And then often at the end, they went, this is great. Could we do more of this? Fantastic. But even the folks who didn't, I was able to share advice and resources. And a lot of the folks that I chatted with, uh, Charlie's on this call with somebody who came through. We had a chat way back when became evangelists for my newsletter, who shared it with friends and talked about it on social. And that was a win. Those sorts of folks who chat with me and knew me are the people who often show up in my LinkedIn comments when I post something and go, this is great. I love this. And that helps me expand my reach. So there's a lot of benefit there. But certainly if you have a subscription uh, or membership or you're selling something, you definitely want to be telling readers about that. First, warm them up, help them get to know you, build the relationship, then help them take the next step. Yeah, like one of the things I stole from Josh Spector, who runs the For the Interested newsletter, is whenever someone becomes a paid subscriber to my newsletter, it automates an email saying something to the effect of, uh, please introduce yourself and tell me what can I do to help you. And probably about a third of people who convert into subscribers actually, you know, respond to that email. And then we have like a dialogue. And sometimes those people end up being like podcast guests or something like that, because they are actually, you know, running a really interesting media list. What well, One thing, uh, and I see some questions piling up, I'm going to call on people soon. Um, one thing that you talk about introducing yourself. One thing I see a lot of newsletter creators doing wrong is not having something at the very top of their newsletter newsletter, every single issue, just like briefly explaining what this newsletter is and who you are, because people might sign up for your newsletter and they don't get it for another week. And by that point, they forget that they signed up for it. So, you know, informing them, you know, who you are, you know, what you do. So it's like, oh, I, I remember I signed up for that newsletter a week ago. And also a lot of people forward newsletters. So if you're getting an, uh, a newsletter forwarded, you're like, like, obviously they want you to read the content, but having some context at the top of what this newsletter is, where can I sign up for it? That can, you know, help in terms of retention and not getting people to unsubscribe and different stuff like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think in general, little things, and, and for certain for certain newsletter products, uh, Substack or Beehive or two that come to mind where you can share a slightly different experience on web than you can in email. So if you're on a web and you know that article is being shared, you may definitely want to have not just an intro, but also a pitch around your subscription. Or you may want to think about something like the, I call it like the table of contents approach at the end. If you got to the very end of the newsletter, what's next? Well, you can subscribe to my newsletter. You can pay for a subscription. You can advertise with me. You can follow me on social media. We have these events coming up. Give them the next steps for things that they can do. You got to the end, you're here. Well, what can I get you to do next as part of the process? Those things are absolutely worth trying. Mikey, you had a question about referral programs like Sparkloop and Paved and a few others. Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, we've been uh, approaching a lot of newsletter creators individually to when they seem like they've got uh, overlapping audiences with, with us to see if they could use their ad slot or do a mention with us in a paid promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, those cost per acquisitions, uh, the best one we've done has been like a $2.50 cost per acquisition. At worst, <laughs> you don't even want to know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, from what we've been reading about Sparkloop and the way that they do their referral affiliate program, you can get the CPA down to about $2.50 or so. And that's something that you can kind of position yourself. You can kind of set that. I also understand that Sparkloop also like makes sure that those particular people who they get are active and are still around and don't charge you for like a week afterwards. But just, I haven't talked with any customer of Sparkloop to know what their opinions might be. And Dan, before you answer that question, let me just give context for everybody. Sparkloop has an affiliate program where if you're a newsletter creator who wants to build your list, you can create affiliate links where if another newsletter creator recommends your news newsletter and someone clicks on that link, and can signs up for it, you're only paying $3 per conversion. And then if they, you know, they drive 10 conversions, then you're just paying the $30. So it's a great way for newsletters to monetize and also, and then also grow their audience on the other side. Okay, Dan, turning over to you. 
All right. I'll also do the caveat here where I made an investment in Sparkloop a couple of years ago. So you should caveat all of this with <laughs> that knowledge. Sparkloop, like any other program out there, uh, one is the folks behind these, these tools always put on their absolute best face. I've never seen an email platform that has on their website, you know, the tool is fine. It works for some people, not for everybody. And why I say this just because there are no magic bullets. There are no things that I say, everyone should do this. Everyone should have a referral program. Everyone should be in the Sparkloop Upscribe network. Everyone should be using, you know, X, Y, or Z tool. And if you don't, you're a fool. Like, this is not the case. And one of the, the biggest pain points that I hear from writers who are in this space is, I read this case study about so-and-so newsletter, and they did X, and I tried, and it didn't work for me. What's wrong? Am I doing something wrong? And the answer may just be, your audience is different than their audience. And what works for one brand, what works for one newsletter doesn't always work for another. I will say for anyone who's thinking about doing paid acquisition, the single most important thing I can recommend is not just tracking the cost per lead, how much you call, you know, how much it costs to acquire the email address, but what happens in the 30, 60, 90 days after they sign up and being able to do the cohort analysis to say, this is this group of subscribers, for instance, you know, Sparkloop and Upscribe, they're doing a great job. A lot of folks are signing up, you're growing lists, you have a you know fixed cost you're spending, fantastic. But you also have to make sure afterwards you're tracking to see what happens to these subscribers 30, 60, 90 days down the road. Are they still engaging with us? They stick around. And for some, you know, writers and creators that I talk to, they're saying, yeah, the folks we're getting from certain types of newsletters these are working fantastically well. It's the right audience. They're coming onto our platform. They're going through our onboarding series. They're engaged and they love our newsletter. It's been a really effective growth tactic for us. Other newsletters are saying, you know, hey, we promise these subscribers, you know, I promise these newsletters $4 per subscriber. And so people are recommending us because it's a high cost per lead. They're getting a lot of money in return but these folks aren't engaging with us. They're, they're signing up, they're reading a couple of newsletters, and they're drifting off. It's not the right audience. So we're actually spending money on wisely. So you really have to track what's happening afterwards, not just the cost per lead. This is true also for Facebook ads. This is true for contests and partnerships. And if you're on a platform that can't track those sorts of, do that sort of cohort analysis, you know, what is this, you know, we sign these people up via this source, what happened 30, 60, 90 days down the road, you may find that you're growing your list, but those people aren't engaging and you're not spending money in the right places. Now, you can always start small. Sparkloop, for instance, has these kind of magic links that you can do where you can say, hey, I'm going to give a one-click link to somebody else, I'm going to run it in their newsletter, someone can sign up, and then I can see afterwards you know, what happens to these folks. They think, you know, Simon, let's say you and I decide to do some sort of cross-promotion, we're both doing media newsletters, you give me a link for my newsletter. I give you new, a link for your newsletter. It's a little funky in this case because you're on Substack and Substack doesn't play nice with this sort of thing, but just in the hypothetical sense, you know, hey, I could track and see, you know, what does Simon's audience do afterwards? Uh, after they sign up, they stick around, do they engage, do they like this sort of thing? Being able to track those sorts of numbers is super important. I actually am publishing a thing next week all about this with a couple of orgs that, that have done this. And, you know, some have said, we invested a lot in these certain channels and it worked great. And some have said, we actually saw, for instance, this one brand, um, they'll be in the case study next week, but I'll share now, there's a newsletter called Fantasy Life. Uh, that's uh, Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. It's a fantasy football newsletter. And they saw really good returns in terms of uh, signups from certain channels like Facebook and TikTok, but found that the Facebook audience was 10% more likely to click than the TikTok audience because they were tracking it over time. They were able to say, hey, while the TikTok spend is pretty similar to the Facebook, call, you know, the cost per lead is pretty similar, the engagement is much higher on Facebook. That's where we want to pivot our spend. That's where we want to spend our money because ultimately we're not about just driving, you know, initial sign up and growth. The vanity metrics don't matter. What we care about is engagement. We care about clicks. And so being able to track those numbers down the road helped them figure out well, where do we invest going forward and what are the right channels for us? Yeah, it's kind of speaking to that whole thing where you can't really just copy and paste the strategy, you know, uh, Morning Brew and The Hustle, and we have Brad Wolverton from The Hustle on this call. They got a lot of press for 
you know, the, their use of these referral programs mm-hmm. where, you you know, you get a free mug or a free T-shirt and so many other newsletters tried to copy them and they just fell flat on their face. I was talking to, you know, one um, the guy who runs a Daily Upside who was just saying, uh, I had him on my podcast. He's like, my my readers were uh, kind of like an older cohort who shared. So it just really speaks to like, you can't just copy and paste what works for other newsletters. Yeah, and there, there is no single, you know, one size fits all solution. These things are certainly worth testing. I had a great conversation this week with the team at Payload. They're a space newsletter. In fact, some of the folks on their team used to work in Morning Brew. Yeah, and they Ari, out- Ari is a constant. Uh, he usually comes to these. He's not on today's, okay. but, uh, he, but he he's a subscriber. Yeah, but they, you know, there's a great example of one where they put a referral program out into the world. They're on Beehive, so there was a built-in one. There wasn't a lot of risk for them to try it and found that it actually worked better than they thought. They had an older audience. They had an audience that a lot of folks have got .gov email addresses when these folks do it. And they found, you know, they kind of did it as a test, as a trial balloon. It works. They're doing more. Other brands try it and go, you know what? We offer digital rewards. Like I, I you know, work with, actually, the, the folks at uh, the, the Fantasy Life newsletter was, was a good example of this. Um, they tried a referral program and found that fantasy football people didn't really want to share their newsletter because the people they would have shared it with their friends are the ones they're competing with in fantasy football. So it didn't really matter how good the rewards were. They didn't want their friends to have the same advice that they had when it came to picking the, you know, their teams because they're competing against them. So a referral program, they tried it and said, you know what? The data says, this isn't really where we want to go. Let's pivot and let's try other things. So there is a no one size fits all solution. You got to try a lot of stuff, see what works for you, double down on the things where you're seeing returns. Alexis, you had a question about growth strategies. Oh, I was just curious to hear from Dan about um, what you're seeing working now, what, what people are talking about in terms of growing the newsletter subscribers. Yeah, I mean, certain things like recommendations are really hot right now and getting a lot of love. Um, again, you have to monitor to see which types of things are driving returns for you. I find that local newsletters, for instance, aren't seeing a lot of return on recommendations from things like Substack because, well, there's only so many other local newsletters to recommend versus national brands or larger writers who are having success. Um, I'll also say that there's still lots of opportunities around paid. You know, Facebook, still a pretty good channel, paid, you know, advertising on other newsletters. Um, but the best source of growth has been and continues to be content that lives for free out in the world. So, you know, building a really good website, having content that people can find and share, because if somebody likes my newsletter, will they forward along? Yes. But having that additional place, you know, I'm seeing this right now with my own newsletter, had a newsletter for several years done well. People shared the award of mouth. Fantastic. But the growth that I see now that I'm publishing original content on a website where people can read it, see it, there's different calls to actions and signups has just really helped accelerate the growth of my newsletter because there's a piece of content that can be shared in a different way than a newsletter. Um, Even if someone takes that, you know, view and browser link and shares it, it's a little different sharing a newsletter than it is sharing a, a piece of content. Content is still by a wide margin, the one thing that works for every single brand, every single newsletter, creating good stuff and making sure that your website is optimized to, to capture email addresses and funnel folks on. But other stuff, events as a sign-up mechanism, recommendations, paid, um, are all certainly things that are worth thinking about too. Swaps with other newsletters, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned like making sure your website is optimized. Too many publishers, they just have a a generic sign up for my newsletter link. Would you agree that they should have a more descriptive language about what exactly people are getting and what's the value proposition? Like just increasing that from a 1% conversion rate to a 1.5% conversion percent conversion rate, especially when you have a lot of audience scale, can go a huge way. Oh, sure. I had a conversation literally yesterday with a client who said, we're launching this newsletter you know, it's going to be kind of occasional. We're mostly going to use it to promote uh, events and stuff we're selling, that sort of thing. I said, okay, can you tell me why someone should sign up? And there was a very long pause. I said, all right, this is going to be our challenge. Yes, this sort of newsletter is fine to put out into the world, but if the pitch for the newsletter is sign up to be marketed to, 
and that's the only value, well, readers are busy. They have other things going on in their lives. What's the value? What's the thing that makes this newsletter special, unique, that I'm going to want to spend time with? Why I'm going to make time in my inbox? Because for me, the, the inbox is still very much this digital living room. You let in the people and brands and newsletters that you like, and you get to kick out the ones that you don't. So if you want someone to, to let you into their space, and it is their space, got to make a compelling pitch. If you're not sure what the pitch is, surveys are a great way to find that out. Over the years, I have recommended seeing this over and over again. Do a survey of your audience, ask them why they like the content that you're publishing, what they look forward to, what's most valuable. Take their words and language and use that as the call to action to sign up. If someone tells you, I like this newsletter because of X, and you hear that over and over and over again, make sure that on your nine newsletter sign up page, sign up for my newsletter because you get X is the reason and the value there. Uh, Hannah asked a quick question, a technical question. You were talking about all these kind of automations like welcome emails and stuff like that. Like, how do you do that on Substack? I could be wrong, Dan, but um, yes. I'm pretty sure one of the, uh, the one of the downsides of Substack is you, you really don't get that that kind of extra sophistication. So it's obviously a free platform and that's great, but the trade-off is some of that more sophisticated marketing stuff you just can't do through Substack. Yeah, Hannah, for some of my newsletter like yours, if you want to try something like this, and I think it would actually make a lot of sense for knowing your particular audience writing about food. If you want to create something like a course, fantastic. Look at another platform to do these sorts of things. I've had teams that have said, you know, we're going to launch it, but we're going to use, you know, Aweber or ConvertKit or Beehive or something else to, to do the first run of these sorts of things. Um, you could also look at a, another platform that exists out there, like a Podia or something like that, where they might have some built-in options as a way to say, we're going to consolidate the, the course kind of offering into something, uh, into another place. There oh. isn't, I wish Substack would build this out as a, as a feature, but if you want to try it out, absolutely go for it. Use another platform to test it out. And then if it works well, maybe down the road, you say, shoot, this is working so well that I may have to think about whether or not I want to stay on Substack and have everything there or if I want to go somewhere else where it can all be one place. Thanks, Dan. That's super helpful. And then will I be able to direct people back to my Substack for subscriptions or is there going to be any conflict there? there that's also where, again, with Substack being a close platform, you'd have to direct people back from, you yeah. know, they signed up, they got this course, you want to subscribe and pay, now you have to go to a second place. It's a little annoying, but you know, if you're just trying to get an MVP out there, just something to say, does this work? How do people respond? There's no reason why you couldn't do it and have it be a little bit imperfect. That's really okay. Because you're just trying to see, hey, and this, whether you're launching a course or launching any sort of new product, how do people respond? Is this valuable? Should I do more with this? Um, and this is a good opportunity for you to test and learn and then decide what you want to do, you know, more or less of going forward. Yeah, it's awesome. that's exactly where I am with this. So will you tell me again, what would be the most accessible platforms for me to try? So this is like, it's a five-part course that I've developed. Yeah, so honestly, something like Aweber is a really good link. Um, I'll shoot you a link to it later. Uh, <laughs> uh, Aweber is a really good option though, just because of the cost and sophistication for a small newsletter, you pay, you know, barely anything to use that tool as that to start. Cool. Yeah, Tanya, Tanya in the chat suggests ConvertKit. I know a lot of other people, I've never used it, but a lot of people speak highly of ConvertKit. Con ConvertKit's fabulous as well and is also a great option. Uh, super sophisticated and a lot of really cool things there as well. Yeah. Um, so we had so Dan has a hard stop at the end of the hour. So this is, you know, this is the free for all. Like he he has eight more minutes to answer your questions. I'd love to, I'd love to turn it over to you guys. Brad. Yeah. Quick question that follows up on what Lexi was asking just generally about growth tactics. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of work on growth has to do with churn and like making sure you're not losing people, obviously. Um, Dan, and I guess you spoke to this a little bit with regard to like giving advice on having a survey strategy and then um, also better onboarding and making sure you're doing everything to like make sure people don't leave you. What are you seeing kind of what distinctive things are you seeing out there right now regarding like making yourself indispensable? and creating habit forming um, services and products that make people like stay engaged. How do you make yourself indispensable? Uh, I wish I had a good answer to that. I, I have a mediocre answer to that question, <laughs> which <laughs> is one, finding a really specific audience that you think you can serve. 
And two, being really careful to make sure that whatever you're putting out is special enough or unique enough that it stands out. I had a great conversation earlier today with a reader who was telling me, you know, I'm on this platform, I'm writing about this topic. There's 25 other people who also write around this topic, but I really thought my newsletter could be the one that stands out. And we just, we're going back and forth. And I was just saying, you know, I don't know there's enough here at this stage of the game that stands out that makes you, someone say, oh, I would subscribe to your newsletter versus one of these many, many other things that also covers the same topic. People stand out for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's just because they've been in a space for a long time and been a voice and they have, have authority or some sort of influence or a big audience. Sometimes it's because they do something really unique. Um, but making sure that you're really clear about kind of where you fit in with the ecosystem. I mean, shoot, I've been doing this with newsletters for a couple of years, but even I am thinking about, you know, where do I stand out? There's other people. When I first started not a newsletter, there really weren't a lot of people writing about newsletters for kind of an editorial first audience. Now there are more, but a lot of the folks who are doing it are still writing around growth or scale. And I'm thinking about, well, what do I do well? It's monetization, it's audience research, it's personalization, it's launching new products and testing. There's still lots of spaces that I can play in oak deliverability. Where are the where are the different sandboxes that I can play in, and how do I continue to build up a really unique offering uh, that serves a broad audience, but you know also is kind of specialized at the same time. Uh, but if you ever get stuck or you ever feel like your audience isn't growing, a lot of it comes back to, you know, is what I'm doing special enough or unique enough? No, I've never met anyone who says, I cannot wait until I sign up for another 10, 12, 15 newsletters. But you have to figure out, all right, is what I do special, unique? Is there a unique audience for it? Am I delivering really valuable content every time I send it? All those things are things that, you know, if they're not there, might be hindering your growth. Charlie, I see your hand raised, so go for it. The key to indispensability is a subject line. That is, every time you dispatch an email newsletter, your subject line is a chance to encourage your audience to engage with your content, to justify your existence. So many email newsletters squander that subject line space with repetition. Uh, it, it, it saddens me. Subject line, subject line, subject line. I'll stop now. Bo, you had a question around the natural next step after Substack. We got 150K LinkedIn subs, 60K on Substack, 1K paid. How do we get out of the awkward tweens? So this is really an interesting thing because as your newsletter grows, people get stuck at certain places, especially as you start to hit. And it's, this is not a, a, a pick on Substack kind of conversation. Um, Substack does a lot right. Some writers stick with them for a long time just because they go, oh, I like it. There's all these features, tools, everything is built in. I'm really comfortable with that. Switching platforms. And I, I talk all the time with writers who have you know, left and some have said, it was the best decision I ever made. Uh, I was able to take full control over everything, be able to save money. And others go, I switched and found the grass wasn't greener on the other side. <laughs> you know, I really discovered that I liked a lot of those features and was willing to give up a little bit more of my revenue to do so. For something like, you know, FinTech Nexus, a lot of this is about just deciding how much control do you need as you all build out other things like expand the website or expand into events or other things, you know, do we need to be able to have everything in one place? And can you find the right tech partner to work with you? That could mean an email platform like Ghost, ConvertKit, uh, could also be looking at a tool or you know, a company like there's a great one called Market Done uh, that works with a lot of larger newsletters and tries to connect the dots behind the scenes with tech to help you know, streamline things. You know, can we find the right tech people in, in, to help us take the next step if we decide to leave? Uh, we get, maybe if you have just three more minutes, Chris, you Let's had a quick question about, uh, how to integrate podcasts with newsletters and how to get them to kind of have some synergy with each other. So yep. podcast, sorry. Chris, Chris Ryback. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You Simon. Yep. D mindful of time. Yes, Dan, that's the question. Um, who's doing it well in a way that, uh, uh the audio versus email approaches drive retention, reduce churn, or even grow users. So audio and email, I would think about them as complementary tools as opposed to uh, tools that necessarily fuel a lot of growth. So for instance, you know, if you have a great newsletter and then you have a side podcast, it expands the content you can produce, it expands 
uh, your reach. It gives you uh, access to an audience that might want to listen to you while they're driving versus reading you while they're at home or at work. Um, but I think about often about how those tools complement each other. So it allows you to extend your reach. Some people try to try to duplicate what they're doing. So if we have the podcast, we need the newsletter equivalent, and that's really tricky. Um, I've worked on ones in the past where the podcast has a newsletter component. There's stuff we're talking about or wanted to share to like extend the community sometimes. And that's why you're signing up for the newsletter. But often I think about them as kind of complementary tools, sometimes that overlap, but often that don't. Anyone besides Ben Thompson who you think does it well? Maybe you don't think Ben does it well, but anyone who you, I think Ben does it well. Anyone who you think does it well? Ben does it well, but also Ben has been doing it for a long time. Um, I'm not going to give you a great answer off the top of my head right now. I'm sorry. I, I think, think Planet it. I think Planet Money does some interesting That's stuff uh, where they'll talk about exclusive content they have in the newsletter to drive, you know, not just saying sign up for our newsletter, but they'll actually, you know, talk about content that their people are missing out on with the newsletter and stuff like that. Yeah, one that I'll say that's coming that's going to be really good. I know because I've been chatting with them about this is uh, up at WBUR. They've been a long time client. They have this really cool product called Circle Round, which is this great podcast for stories for kids. Fabulous. And they're launching a kids club. It's a membership program and the newsletter is connected to the membership program. So they have the audio component, do stuff with kids, and they have this membership program where they're giving additional resources, activities, tips and advice for parenting that's going to complement it. So that's really exciting. But NPR is a good one. I do like plant monies. Okay, Dan. Well, I know you have a hard stop at one. Thank you so much for joining us. In terms of information density, this is definitely one of the best 60-minute uh, office hours that we've uh, had so far. So thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Um,